This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Julia Cho. How are you doing, Julia? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I am excited to talk to an Pixar insider, what it's like to work inside of the magic machine that we all have grown up with and love so much. But that's not your only claim to fame, and we're going to get into your whole journey, which is not – you just weren't born out of uh, you know Pixar's womb, and you've been there yeah. all this time. You've, you've, you're, uh, you, you've done other things in life. So how did you and why did you want to get into this insanity that is the film industry? <laughs> oh, well, that's uh... – how, how long is this podcast? You know, um, it was uh, not necessarily a, a decision, like an intention that I had. I mean, my first love was theater, right? right? So I had kind of grown up loving to read and wanting to be a writer. And for me, I got the theater bug as a teenager and then just si- kind of found myself veering towards writing when I was in college and started writing plays. And at that point, I would say I was just a fan of the movies. I would just watch movies as a normal lay person. And I do remember watching the Pixar movies even back then as a young adult and just being like, I love these. I know they're for kids, but I love them, you know. Um, and there was one moment where I think um, on a date with my, uh, who's my with the guy who's my husband now, but we went on an early date to see Monsters, Inc. And oh. I remember like at the time I was really just still a struggling playwright and I just couldn't imagine anything more diametrically opposite to what I was doing, you know, because it was like what I did were these like really heavy, sad plays in tiny rooms the size of a closet that like 10 people saw. And then here I was watching Monsters, Inc., which made me cry, but also just made me laugh. And and it was so exuberant. And I just remember articulating to my uh, husband, I don't know what to call somebody who becomes that, but we were walking out and I'm like, oh, it'd be so amazing to work at Pixar someday, you know. Um, So I I do, I start to become like a firm believer of putting it out there in the universe because I think the fact that I actually said that just started some atomic ripple maybe that like years later uh, came back to me because then I continued to do plays um, and then I was doing a play at Berkeley Rep uh, and just to make the long story short, uh, uh, Pixar is always looking for writers and Mary Coleman who's the head of development there among many jobs that she does one of them is to always kind of be looking for writers to come to Pixar uh, and through a friend uh, who uh, I have a friend who's a playwright screenwriter named Keith Bunin who was uh, working on Onward um, she I think came to me and actually came to see the play that I was doing in Berkeley and so I think that's kind of how it started so I would just say uh, in a kind of accidental way through my theater, I actually ended up being tapped to come to Pixar, which I never would have ever predicted. And that's so funny because so many people who have the intention, like, I'm going to work for Pixar. I'm going to do everything right to get on the radar of Pixar and do this or that and that. And you did none of that. You just said, hey, how cool would it be? And then if you would have gone back to talk to that person coming out of Monsters, Inc., you're going to go, hey, you're going to work on Pixar one day. And you're like, (laughs) who are you? You're psychotic. Get away from me. Yeah, you are insane. That's never going to happen. No, and I do find that um, life keeps doing that to me. Like, I keep seeing ways in which you think the way to do life is to like figure out exactly what you want and just head straight towards it. And some people, maybe that works for them. But for me, it's always been kind of just steering towards writing as honestly as I can, writing the things I want to write, you know, and just sort of pursuing that. And then completely out of the blue comes something that I couldn't have anticipated. Uh, and, And that's just been the way it's been for me. Uh, and Pixar was definitely like that because I never, never made that a goal. And uh, I even mean, think you could make it a goal. Like, and, you, and to it, this day, I think, yeah, you can't. It's Pixar has to find you. You can't. You can't go knocking on the door and and hand them your script. It's yeah. It's kind of like uh, you know, I've, I've had so many writers and directors on the show who've told me like Spielberg g- gave me a shot. I'm like, how did you get the Spielberg? Like, you, it's like I didn't like knock on his door and hand him a script. It just like that kind of that energy will eventually find you when if that's the path that you need to walk. And it's so interesting that no matter what you did along your path, nothing even, there wasn't even an inkling because I looked at your your resume. There's nothing that says Pixar. Like there's not even, there's not even a short film. There is not like any, even your story, like the, the shows you've worked on, nothing says this would make a good Pixar screenwriter. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and then, and then I, yeah. And then I think it's also been illuminating though, because, uh, you know, once I got there, I felt like, yeah, total fish out of water. And it was really gratifying then to meet the other writers and realize a lot of them had motley backgrounds too. You know, other right. playwrights had ended up at Pixar, not just me. Um, so yeah. uh, I do feel like the perception is that there is a certain thing you'd expect out of Pixar writer. And then I have found that the actual writers there are much more idiosyncratic uh, interesting bunch. Right, exactly. Because if you, it makes it makes the writing more interesting when you have a motley crew, a motley background, as you say. Yeah, yeah, and I think that um, you know, no one there, I don't think I've encountered yet, did feature animation before coming to Pixar. You know, and when you think of what that world is of feature animation writers, it's really small. And I think that Pixar feels like we've got that covered. You know, <laughs> like the people here know how to do feature animation. So what that kind of frees up is that the writer can come with a different set of skills. Um, and I think that's been really great. That's sort of like, you don't have to overlap on our Venn diagram. You can actually have your own thing and we can have a, a place where we all meet, but we actually want people who think differently or have different experiences. Now, you, uh, you also went to Juilliard and, uh, and the Sundance Lab as well? Early yeah, in your career? As a playwright. Yeah, I did. I, a... I got to develop a play at Sundance and go to Juilliard on a, uh, yeah, no, do a playwriting residency there. I, I, again, both things don't suck at all uh, <laughs> if you're a writer. So, what are some of the biggest lessons you took away from you since you were such a young writer at that point from working yeah. in those two amazing you know, programs? Oh, well, gosh. Sundance was really illuminating because I was so young. I think that was one of the first kind of professional-ish experiences I had. And I just remember feeling like that first play I was trying to write, I really struggled with. And um, I just had a moment where <laughs> I got to the point where I was so lost. And I was working on a piece of writing, but just felt like I couldn't like really land it. And I just remember getting on my knees and praying. I like literally prayed to God. I was like, I don't know what to do. And um, this play, I need to present it before the entire Sundance <laughs> group, right? Because we're all doing readings for each other. And I just remembered doing a prayer that, I don't remember word for word, but the gist of it was like, please help me get out of my own way. Please just l larger force. I don't know what you are, God, the universe, just just take over, you know, because like, I think it, it's like, I think, and I, I couldn't articulate it at that age, but I think it was this sense of like, rather than trying to generate something from my ego, like, please help me tap into something and be a conduit to something instead, you know? And I think that was maybe the first time I'd really thought about writing in that way. Cause I kept seeing writing as like something I did that was out of my ego and my identity. And and I think that that was maybe the beginning of feeling like writing was, if it was working right, was actually me tapping into something or me channeling something, you know? And so I don't think I succeeded, to be honest, completely, but at least that was where I felt that first intuition of like, oh, there's a different way to, to write. Um, and then I think the thing I learned from being at Juilliard, which was some years later, I was a little bit more experienced, um, but not very. Uh, I just remember, so my teachers there were Marsha Norman and Chris Durang, who are both like lauded, amazing, you know, American playwrights with a capital A and a P, you know, they're, they're amazing. And um, we would come in with our like 10 pages, like we would just come in with 10 pages. And I just remember that at the time I was writing a lot of really just sad or <laughs> dark stuff. <laughs> and um, we would talk about our voices and what we were trying to write. And I just remember Marsha being like, you know, we all want to be Neil Simon. We all want to just write funny and happy, you know, and she's like, you are who you are. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't wish you were a different type of writer than the writer you are. So don't even bother. Don't even waste time doing that. Um, and that helped because I think I was in that mode of like, why can't I write funnier, happier things? And she was just <laughs> like, uh, uh too bad. You just, you, you are who you are. And then the other thing she would do, which uh, has stayed with me, is she always kind of referred to writers as warriors, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, I think the image of us is we're drunken and soft and, you know, just like laying around in our bathrobes, like typing, you right. know. Um, and she really reminded us of how much courage it takes to write and Oof. how tough you have to be to write. And she always spoke of us as, you know, 
warriors if we were really engaged in doing it right. So I think that kind of stayed with me. So, you know, that's so funny because I, you know, I've had, the, again, the pleasure of talking to so many amazing screenwriters and filmmakers. And I always ask, especially with writers, I go, is there ever a moment where you just wrote something down and you go back to read it and you go, who wrote that? That's amazing. Oh, all the time. Yeah. Well, I don't. <laughs> not the amazing. Anymore, I'm not sure about. Not the amazing, yeah. but but you just like how did like something literally hit, you tapped into something that wasn't you, but it is. This is what I found as a writer myself. Yeah. When you tap into that thing, it is that that energy, and this goes for Oscar winners, Emmy winners, Tony winners. I've spoken to. They tap into that thing, but it comes in filtered through you. So it is a filtering process that you are the filter. So it comes out through your voice, but it still comes through you. And if it comes, if you're not in a place of ego when you're doing it, because I've written in a place of ego, horrible, uh, horrible, horrible to write in that place. But when you write when you're like what you said, then you feel something coming through you. It's so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And it's rare. I think yeah. like that's the thing. It's like you can't plan it. You just right. kind of and, and I really do feel like it started to become like, you know, the way surfers go out every day. You just they go out every day. And some days the waves are awesome. And some days the waves <laughs> suck, you know, and I, and I increasingly felt like riding was like that. I would show up every day and someday I catch a nice wave. But other days they'd be like, uh, oh, nothing happened today. <laughs> that's a know? great analogy. Nothing. That's a great yeah. analogy. I love that. Well, analogy. Well, because the waves aren't generated by the surfers, right? The waves are coming from, I don't know, whatever it is that causes waves, the tide, the moon, the gravitational pull of the universe. So uh -huh. yeah, it definitely feels like I'm not generating the wave. I'm trying to catch it, but I can't catch it unless I show up. I so will, my job I'm... is just to show up. I will steal that because that's an amazing analogy. I love, <laughs> love that analogy. You're absolutely right because as a writer, as a creative, you're trying to catch waves, but you have to show up every day because you never know when the really gnarly wave is going to show up and you're going to be there to catch it. Yeah. And how many times, I mean, I'm sure you've also had the experience of like showing up and feeling like crap, like, oh my God, I barely <laughs> slept. I feel, I, right. I feel awful. Nothing good can come up today. And then it ends up being a great day. Like something mm -hmm. happened you know, and vice versa. I've had days where I go and I'm like, I'm ready. I feel I'm ready. good. I'm and there's like, like totally crickets. And there's just crickets. <laughs> yeah. Nothing, nothing. You're just like, oh my God, <laughs> I woke up for this. You know? This is really is this what it is? Um, now, from your work as a playwright, how did that prepare you for writing in Hollywood, writing in a writer's room? It didn't. It didn't at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> it was completely different and weird and hard. I mean, I think as a playwright, like other than the actual production part of it, it's like really built for introverts. You know, like so solitary. And um, I think to go from that to being in a room with seven people, it really felt like Sartre's like no exit. Like it kind of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm like I'm in like a room with like seven people that may or may not like me and I may or may not like them. And there's a lot of vying because like uh, television was yeah. more so before like really hierarchical, right? Like everyone would show up and everybody would be like, who's who's the staff writer? Who's the co <laughs> who's Like it's like monkeys are trying to figure out where we are in the pecking order. Um, and so I think that took a while to adjust to. And I was really lucky though. I mean, I ended up on great shows with great showrunners who um, were so amazing and nurturing about helping this poor little newbie staff writer get her feet wet. Um, but yeah, I remember being completely bewildered. One of my early shows is a show called Fringe yeah. and we would sit there, right? Yeah. So again, somewhat similar to Pixar, nothing in my experience as a I was going to say, I was going to prepare you for Fringe. Like, I was going <laughs> to ask you, I was going to ask you for, because you're in the first season of Fringe. You wrote a bunch of episodes in the first season of, of Fringe, if, according what? to your IMDb. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, how the hell did she get Fringe? Like that's a hell of yeah. a good, a, a plum first job <laughs> yeah yeah no seriously uh yeah so again very similarly i had written these like sad dark plays in closets for 10 people um but you know the thing is like the plays i wrote were uh just very relational and very like they were real like they weren't like you know crazy high concept plays and abstract or experimental so they were readable which helped i think um but you know what i think what i loved about television though is because they're like seven writers it really is more like a team sure. like you don't need every single person to have every single skill, right? Like you literally have people playing different positions, like the way you would on a football team or something, you know? So like at French, it was a really big room. Actually, it was like, I don't know, like 
11 or 12 or something. Wow. I don't know. It just it was a large room uh, as befitting a, a large network kind of sure. tent pole show, yeah. right? Uh, which doesn't really exist anymore. But back then, <laughs> you still had those, right? And I just remember being like, oh, like there are certain um, niches that we all play or are all in, right? So there's the action guy, the sci-fi person. The, and I realized quickly early on that I was like, oh, I'm like the, I'm the relational person. <laughs> you know? I deal and with the relationships. Like, yes. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, like I'm the one who like does the emotional like talk. And what was really great is by the end of the season, like I'm pitching crazy sci-fi things too. Like I'm learning all the other ways to be too, you know, like there was a moment where I pitched some insane teaser that didn't go, which was like the main character, like, like being attacked by like, like a troop of paramilitary and like laying them all to waste or something insane and unfilmable. But I just remember my showrunner being like, look what we've done to our little Julia. <laughs> like she's, she came in as his quiet playwright and now she's like doing these B movie action. <laughs> you know, he, he looks so proud. <laughs> he was like, look what we have done. Like, look what we've done. Look. Um, <laughs> look how far she's come. But um, yeah. So, so in, in that sense, I think that was my, my foot in the door. Like the, th the, the feeling that like, Oh, they still need, you know, like one of the main characters was a woman, you know, friend was the main character was, uh, you know, this female. So I think, just this recognition that like on a big series like this, we need lots of points of view and lot people with different tools. So yeah, so even though my tool wasn't like the sci-fi tool, I felt like I had other things that uh, helped me. But yeah, how I got on there, now I look back and I do think that that was really uh, How did you get, and, and, like, how did you get on there? Like who was- Oh, so, so I was on, that was actually not my first show. My first show was a legal procedural, which what made more sense, frankly, that I was, kind of approach for that because it was by a production company that was in New York and the first showrunner who didn't stay and become the boss of it initially was supposed to be a man who was also a playwright like so there were some you know reasonable things with Fringe I think it was just like the, my agent at the time uh, was not the agent of the showrunner but he was somehow like just really Connected. involved with mm -hmm. it I forget exactly how and so he could at least get my work read. So I think just being able to get me read was part of it. Um, and then my, uh, and then I think there was a one play I had where it was like a, a play called Durango that was about a dad and his two sons, and oh, it was all just yeah. about them going on a long road trip together. And oh. I think. Yeah, so I think now it makes all the help. sense of the world now. Yeah, I mean, I think like the showrunner and the other people, the production company read that and could really connect to it. And like, so oh, she, I think that she, it's so funny how Hollywood works yeah. because they're like, when they walk it through the door, you're like, we need someone who's literally written the story about yeah. a father and a son <laughs> who have to kind of go on a road trip. And then you walk in, you're like, perfect, hired. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, so, so weird. Funny. It is. Yeah. And I think you're, but you're kind of right because like Fringe, there was a female main character, but then sure. it was a father son story. It was like, you know, right. and um, so, yeah, I think there was that, but that, you know, I started to jump through the hoops of like getting read and, um, and then also doing my interview and, but we just, I just really got along with the showrunner and we clicked in the interview. So it was That's all awesome. that. And somehow miraculously I ended up on that show. Now, how and uh, you also worked on another one of my favorite shows, Big Love. Um, oh, you I, have really interesting taste. I, I love it. I love Big Love because I was I was a, a Paxson fan, like such a. I mean, oh, I love. I God, uh, rest in yeah. rest in peace. He and was he was wonderful to work with. I wonderful. I've heard nothing from people who have, I've I've I know who've worked with him. They said he was a, yeah. just a doll, a, like a, a yeah. saint. Wonderful mm -hmm. to work with. What was it like working on a show like? Like that because that's a pretty big it was H it was HBO if I'm not mistaken right it yeah was H, so that's was, a big tentpole HBO shows in the in the in the heat of Soprano like HBO had now be HBO was HBO at this point it wasn't like at the beginning of like we're just trying to figure out narrative like they you, you they've already broken through so much stuff what was it like working on that show well then that was a real experience too because <laughs> I felt like I had gone from Fringe which was this J.J. Abrams yeah. Um, you know, Alex Kurtzman, Bob Orsi, you know, huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then to go on to Big Love was kind of wonderful because um, it was more specific. It was more personal. It right. was more idiosyncratic, reflecting the tastes of, you know, the, the creators. Um, and it just felt like 
going from something that was more mass, like mass market to something that was more like boutique or hey, something. Right, right. Know? Yeah. Like, are, like and, and both really good quality in their different ways, but their tastes were so mellow. It was such a melodrama, right? Like, so to learn that genre, like it was a, like, I remember like the touchstones of the shows couldn't be more different because then, um, oh, no, it's like you Temple know, Fringe, versus art, uh, yeah. art house almost. Yes, exactly. So like Fringe, it was like, you had to know, um, you know, X-Files and things like that. And, sure. then, <laughs> and then on Big Love, it was like, you know, you had to know like Joan Crawford movies. You know? <laughs> it was like, you know, what do you mean you haven't seen, you know, uh, what was it, Mildred Pierce? I was like, you have to watch Mildred Pierce. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, and, and then, and I loved it. And I was like, wow, like how, how different to be in that world. Um, and it was really amazing just because like everything was just, everything, just the quality of everything was so high, oh, you know, God. like there was a bit more time and um, even, even the quality of the food was so high. <laughs> I remember being like, "Wow!" Like, listen, like, when you're when you're on a studio, really? when you're on a studio set, and that it's that crap, that crafty boy, that crafty, yeah. and that lunch is a whole other world. I remember yeah. working on. I, I walk on some shows, and it was like some Fox shows I was working on. And I walk on, I'm like, "Wow, man, is that lobster? Are, is is literally are the grips eating lobster right now? Like, is this?" <laughs> Because I come from yeah. an indie world where like everyone like pizza is like whoa pizza, yeah. no. it, it's a whole other it's a whole other experience. I mean, so you've been yeah. in a few so you've been in a few writers room. Do you have any advice for young writers who, if they have the opportunity to either be in a writers room as a writer or as an assistant or as a runner, what to do when you're in that environment? Because it, I, from my understanding, I've never been in a writer's room, but from my understanding, it really all depends from the showrunner. It all starts at the show. Like the showrunner could be a tyrant or they could be the most wonderful, you know, kind of like in- inclusive and I want to hear everybody's idea. And then there could be the the tyrant who's like, it's my way or the highway and everyone's fearful to even say a thing. Uh, and, I've, and I've heard both yeah. both of those stories. So it sounds like you had the, the latter, the, the good, very encouraging, fun environment. How do you navigate the politics of that room because they're in politics in those rooms that's a great yeah that's a great question i mean you know the funny thing is like i have had really nice showrunners but even so it's been a really complicated and very uh often kind of tense environment just because really? everyone is under such an enormous amount of pressure um i mean i would say that for anyone starting out being in the room in any capacity is actually a huge education you know it's like mm-hmm. if you want to be a writer I do think the best way, if you can uh, find it, is a position of being a writer's assistant. Um, and I would say that, you know, I could be wrong, but um, even if the showrunner is difficult, the writer's assistant, the job is pretty clear cut. You know, you're just basically taking all the notes of everything that people are saying and pitching and then having to sort of disseminate them. So in some ways, it's like, I don't know how much better or worse your job can get. <laughs> you know what I mean? In some ways, like, unless there's, you know, interpersonal stuff. But um, I do feel like the job is pretty, uh, pretty direct. And what it allows you to do is to understand how to pitch and understand um, how to listen and give feedback to and, and you're and basically you're learning all those things because you're seeing people in real time do those things with each other. And I do think that perspective makes it so that whenever I meet an assistant, number one, if you're an assistant, I am always impressed because that is not an easy job to get it. So you are some kind of rock star. <laughs> just to, I mean? just like to get there. I meet. Yeah, I'm like, you are a rock star. I don't know what your background is, but you are super smart and you're on it. And then the second thing I feel like when I uh, am with these writers assistants is that um, I have been in rooms, I'm in a room now where the assistants regularly pitch, like not often because I think that they are actually, you know, busy taking the notes or doing other things, but their um, perspectives are always valuable and are always like really smart. And so I think that as a writer's assistant or someone starting out, initially your job is to listen and to understand what the flow of everything is and the content. And then gradually, I think you can start contributing um, and what I find nine times out of 10 is that if the contribution is very personal, like, oh, we're talking about, um, you know, there's a story point of car accidents and, you know, and if you're an assistant who's been in a car accident, then by all means, you should, <laughs> you should speak up and be like, I, t- I, oh, this one, this happened. I felt this way. I felt that way because that kind of stuff is always invaluable. You know, right. I think the w- where assistants can get more into trouble is if they start like judging what's happening. Like, I don't think that's a good idea because that could be, like that's going to be hard for anyone 
to say or do. Right. But I think as long as you're just contributing to the personal, like that's almost always like a really great way to begin getting like winning the trust of the room and then eventually, you know, building on that. And yeah, I think it's a really hard job, but a really, uh, I mean, the ones who have been writing assistance, writing assistance before, I think, just have a complete leg up on the other writers. So if you if so if you have been attacked by a paramilitary group and you yes. do w- lay waste to them with your superpowers, speak yes. up. Speak up. Yes, please. please. When you were 14 and developed your super mutant powers, please share how that was. How does that make you feel? <laughs> is that is it like X-Men? Does X-Men get it right? Yeah. Like, how does that, that work? That you felt when, when you started playing. Um, but no, but so, yeah. so on a writer's assistant side, that's great. But as a writer, you know, there is that it's it's that like you said tense, weird political environment, and I don't mean political in a bad way. It's no. just the nature of any time you get seven or eight people in a room together. There's a yeah. hierarchy. How do you not step on other people's toes? How do you, you know, like? Because there are do's and don'ts that are not written down anywhere. So yeah. like you don't. I, I forgot. I heard somebody in, in in a writer's room tell me like. You know, don't go behind somebody's back. Say it in the in the room. Th- things like that. They, but these are things they don't teach you, and you have to learn the hard mm-hmm. way. Yeah, no, I think that's all really hard and difficult. Uh, I, I guess the main thing I would say is that if you're stepping into that a room, whether as a writer or an assistant, like I think the main thing is openness. You right. know, just to like always assume people are coming from a good place. As opposed to they're out to destroy me, <laughs> which they might be, but at least initially give them the benefit of the let's doubt. Let's walk in. You know? Let's walk in with a positive yeah. attitude as opposed to guns a blaring instead of guns a blaring. Yeah, and you know, and then what I've also learned is that actually I think everyone's nervous in the beginning. Every, you know, yeah, yeah. everyone's nervous, even the higher ups. I think um, because they're also trying to establish that I know what I'm doing, and I who am I in this room and group. Um, so I think there's that. And then there's also, um, gosh, staying out of the line of fire as much as possible, <laughs> you know, just like, you know, keep your head if down. The, yeah, if you're the new one, then it's sort of like, you know, perhaps the parents might argue at times. And, you know, <laughs> what is your role is to be your Switzerland, you're, you're neutral, <laughs> you know, unless something really bad and unfair is happening. You know, I think you try to just do your best. Mom and, and, and dad are really fighting. Because you are. <laughs> the new one so you're sort of like um you're the apprentice that's how i felt when i was a staff writer i really felt like i was the apprentice and my goal was to exude an air of being everyone's little sister like that was my (laughs) that was your way consciously or not that was that was what you were doing yeah so yeah it's always horrible when mom and dad are fighting in the room and you're just like i'm not gonna get on either person's side i'm just gonna stay here very quiet and yeah and they go julia what do you think and you're like "Uh, i don't know yeah (laughs) No, it's so, it's so, it's, yeah, and it happens on a set too. When you're on a set, you know, you see my, the producer or the DP and the director fighting or the producer or director yeah. fighting. You're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm over a craft. Yeah. I'm over yeah. a crafty. Yeah, I'll just be over there eating frozen, you know, mocha bars or something at crafty. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, you know, and I will say, like, I have, you know, been through difficult rooms too, you know, sure. and what, at least the silver lining on all that is that some of my fondest, connections are, came out of the hardest experiences right because you actually do then really bond with the people that you're going through it with so <laughs> right. there is something you know it doesn't redeem the entire experience but then at least you can be like well but i came out of it with these really tight tight connections that's awesome that's awesome now if you happen to, if you were able to go back to your younger self the one that was going into the sundance lab and you could tell her listen you're going to have a crazy situation in the next few years, these next years going up. What piece of advice would you want to give her? I'm like, this is the one thing I wish I would have known. I guess I have been kind of thinking about this, you know, like what would I have extended to my younger self, you know, because I am somewhere that I never anticipated. Um, And it sounds a little hokey or kind of like, I don't know maybe too self compassion but I think I would have tried to unburden my younger self from so much of the fear that she carried, you know, like this fear that I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to succeed. Um, 
I, I remember like when I was telling that earlier story about being on my knees praying. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It, it truly was because I felt like a failure. I felt like I am not able to do this and uh, I can't, you know. Um, and I guess what I would want to tell that younger self is this feeling go this fe- this is just a feeling it's not true you know and mm-hmm. that everything i have now was always in me you know it may right. not have been i had the, all the tools or all the skills but i i am the same person and i was always capable of the things that i could do i just didn't know it then and so i think where i i don't want to necessarily give my uh my younger self, like an ego complex. It's like, hey, hey, dude, dude, like, dude, you're going to go but, to Pixar in like no, X yeah. amount of years. You're going to kill it. You're going to be with JJ yeah. Abrams. You're going to be on an HBO show. You're going to be, no, you're not doing that. But I think what you're saying is so profound because we all carry, as creators, we all carry imposter mm-hmm. syndrome with us at every level, mm-hmm. every level of, of your career. There's a yeah. sense of imposter syndrome. But that fear of like, we're not good enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have I don't have the goods, this or that. And a lot of times, I know this I, just from talking to you from your your path. You might have been fearful of what you were doing. I don't I don't I'm not good enough there. But you didn't even have the understanding. I'm like I'm not good enough to be a Pixar writer because that wasn't even on your radar. <laughs> no, I'm already not good enough to do the things that I was doing back then. Right. Let because alone like on a, such a low right. scale. Yeah. Yeah, so so you add so much more stress to your life for things that really are out of your control well, in so many ways. Yeah, you know, and I guess it is, it, it's it's complicated because I'm not, I'm still sort of sorting through it because, you know, at the same time, my dreams were much more humble when I was smaller, which was like, yeah, just get to the Sunday Theater Lab. I also realized that, like, my goals were always kind of crazy high because it was like, I felt like a failure because I was trying to write something sublime. You know, Mm -hmm. like I wanted to write something great. And, you know, that that's not ambition. I think it's kind of just a sense of like, I want to make something really beautiful, you know. And and so feeling like I was failing at that was also just like um, a profound kind of sense of it was like an existential crisis or something, you know. And and I do think there's something to like going back into your earlier self and being like, have the right goal. You know what I mean? Because like, oh, don't make the goal, the success or the job or the money or the glory, because all those things you actually have not that much control over, right. but you can make it your goal to write something beautiful and honest and moving or something that that helps you heal or, you know, those are things that are in your control of what you can aspire to do. And the crazy thing is if you do those things, then all the rest of the stuff will come by itself. That's so, again, I'll use the word profound because you're absolutely right. Only from being on the path for a, lo- for a while, you can go back yeah. and, and say something that profound because you're absolutely right. When you're younger, you're like, I want to win an Oscar <laughs> or... I want to. I want to. I want to make you know seven figures in a year, like these kind of goals that are really empty goals. But if your goal is, I want to, with my work, help somebody. I want to help myself heal. I want to help other people here. I want to really yeah. take somebody out of their busy day and and have them laugh for an yeah. hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Like those mm-hmm. are the goals that because everything. If you do that well, yeah, everything else comes because yeah. there's so many people looking for that writer. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's a, there's an Andre Agassi story that I really like. He was huh? raised by, uh, so, cause you know, he was a child of an immigrant who like drove him crazy hard. And I guess the story goes that he, when he was growing up, he was a tennis prodigy. Right. Mm-hmm. But what his, what he would do is he would just wail on the ball as hard as he could. He could just hit the ball as hard as he could. And his dad encouraged that. Like instead of telling young little Andre Agassi hit within the lines, he would say, hit the ball as hard as you can. And then eventually it will be in the lines, but don't worry about that. Like don't pull back your swing and hit the ball less hard. So that will go in the lines. Like what, what you want is to actually have the hardest forehand anyone's ever seen. Right. And, and it goes in the line, but, but don't hold back on that, you know? And I think there's something in that about like art and writing. It's like, if we're aiming towards the job or the, the salary, then, that requires hitting in the line, you know what I mean? 99% of the time. 
But what you want as a young artist starting out is just hit the ball as hard as you can, like right out of your mind, like right the craziest, mm -hmm. freakiest thing, like. And then because you could pull it, you could pull that back. Yes, but once you're in the line, you can't you can't hit it out. You know, so start just. Go, go big, fence, go you know? go big first because yeah. as you develop the big swing all yeah. the time, you can then learn how to pivot yes. that swing a little bit over to the left yes. just to get it in the line. But you have the biggest swing on the yeah. court, and the that's skill, what you look. The craft yes, and the lighter, but like, do not, do not, you know, hold back on the power. You know. Yeah, exactly. So, what's well, great? Good stuff. I love this conversation. <laughs> Good stuff. Now, um, now, now, let's get to your new film, Turning Red, which is uh, a, a wonderful film. I saw it the other day, and I was really, I was blown away by the heart of it, the humor of it. It is such a movie of its day. Meaning that mm. the young people in it are not the young people that were in Monsters, Inc. or in other p older Pixar movies. This is a very relevant, updated, you know, experience of what it's like to be a young person. And I have two little young people in my life um, that I see through their eyes what they're going through now. Uh, and it's so different than what you and I went through. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank God there was no internet. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Back for then. Sure. So how did you – so we already discussed how you got in, uh, you got uh, into Pixar uh, as far as you know getting courted to come in. I have to ask you, so you walk into the Pixar building, first day mm -hmm. of work to start working – what is that like? Like just the pressure of like walking through those halls. You've seen the behind the scenes, I'm sure, and some some videos. And you're walking, you're like, oh God, what am I doing here? And that yeah. thing is so big. You must feel like this big. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, I think I felt that way even just coming because you have to have an interview of before course. you get hired, right? So just like coming to be interviewed was really intimidating and um it's a beautiful campus too. Oh, like stunning. it's just saw, this yeah. gorgeous, uh, you know, and again, like coming from theater, which is like cramped, <laughs> sticky floors, rats running through the dressing rooms. <laughs> like, sure, you're sure. Just like, Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. The aura is kind of hard to, to uh, you, like, yeah, you come in and everything glows, but I do remember um, my first day of work, I guess I don't remember the particulars. And I should also say my first day of work was not this project. I, my first Pixar job was actually another project that then uh, I didn't stay on. And, and then I ended up on Domi's. But when I showed up for that first official Pixar day of work, the aura lasted only about 10 minutes. And then I started working and it was so intense that <laughs> I quickly, because cause like I uh, feel like a lot of their projects are like under wraps, right? They have to be very careful. And so I felt like, once I actually showed up, it was like, you're here, finally, the writer, sit down, and then they turned a fire hose of story on you, is what happens, you know, because wow. it's like, here's what all the things we've been thinking about, here's what we need to actually put into a script now, you know, and, and you're just like, fire hose, fire hose, fire hose, you know, and so that that is sort of what it feels like, the, like 10 minutes of aura, and then eight hours of fire hose. <laughs> And, uh, and then and then the aura is gone now and now this is just like yeah, I, I gotta work I gotta like, oh I'm here a magical Mount Olympus where the gods live and then you realize the gods are all really busy making their own movies <laughs> and here's so a then, fire hose of, of story that you gotta deal yeah, with so here, here you're not even a demigod you're just a plain <laughs> a pleasant human. a peasant you're a peasant you're a peasant, you're a peasant that yeah. has been allowed in and now we're yeah now get to work um yeah. now get to work yeah <laughs> now get to work it's so funny because i think that i think we were talking about a little bit off air how pixar builds their story can you talk a little bit about your analogy of how pixar is so different than other animation studios or other studios in general and how they develop story yeah, I, I think that I was used to a more linear development process where you would have like a first draft and then you have iterations of that first draft that just refine the first draft. And I think Pixar encourages you to throw away that first draft and restart from scratch almost with your second and third and fourth. So um, it was kind of surprising to me how how bold and even encouraging a boldness they are at Pixar. Every other place I had been had been about retaining as much as you could. And they were really about 
finding the best thing, even if it meant completely letting go of what you had. And I think that they had done it enough with enough movies that they have a certain confidence that that actually can work um, because it felt insane and hard to do that. Like, what do you mean we can't, you know, build off of the first iterations, you know? Um, and, you know, we didn't throw out 100% of it, but it just felt like with every, um, so like there's a reels process, you know, where once you're greenlit into production, you have like six to eight screenings. And those first screenings, you're presenting the entire movie and getting thoughts and notes on it. And so depending on how each goes that, so the first screening was a certain version of the movie, but then the second screening, because of the notes and thoughts they got on the first, was a totally different movie. And so I was saying to you how I feel like it's a, almost a prototype way of looking at story development, where um, I would imagine that if you could look back and see the, I don't know, let's say eight prototypes that the Apple iPod had, you know, you might have seen like the first prototype was maybe really different, mm -hmm. you know, but what they're saying is like, oh, but the, the wheel works in this prototype. So let's keep the wheel and change everything else. And, that, and that's really kind of what it felt like with each screening that we did. It'd be like this part of the movie works. So let's keep that and then not go forward until every other part of the movie works as well as this part, you know, so at, with every iteration, you're trying to create the best movie as opposed to refining the first movie that you had. Right. And it's and it's like I think like you were saying uh, off air, it's kind of like because they are in Silicon Valley up in up in Northern California, they are yeah. their their founders are tech. You know, Steve yeah. Jobs and um, oh God, I forgot his other name. Uh, not Lasseter, but the other one. Ed yeah, yeah, and, and, they're tech guys. So like yeah. they come at it from a tech, a tech and, way of looking know, at things. And that's just my own pet theory. Sure. On, like why the process is like this. But when I think about Pixar, you know, so often it's lauded as this creative, incredible uh, company, which it is. But to me, when I really think about it, it's also squarely a tech company because everything they do is based upon technology. And I think what doesn't get the credit is how unbelievably advanced their technology is because <laughs> they the technology is why the movies look so good. Like the animators might be doing the incredible animating that they're doing, but there are programmers who are creating Tools. The rigging, the movement, like like all the tools are made by Pixar. Nobody, nobody's making the tools, and Pixar's like you know buying but, them at Home Depot. Like they are literally making everything they do. So it's it's a pretty incredible approach, and I think that you know way of creating technology, maybe even the way programs are created, might have influenced the uh, creative process as well. Now, did you work with the famous Pixar Brain Trust? Of course. Of so course. what is that? I mean, what yeah. is that? So what is that process like? Uh, really terrifying, I would say. I think the first time it was like, who, who's coming? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it was a little... So for everybody, so tell everybody what the brain trust is if they don't know. Well, so the brain trust, I don't even know where the term came about, but it's just that at Pixar, uh, all the directors and creators weigh in on each other's projects. And so um, there is a brain trust of producers and directors. So uh, for us, you know, the people who are around who are weighing in, when I initially came, uh, it was Lee Anchorage, Andrew Stanton, Pete Doctor, of course. Um, so you have like these people who are enormously <laughs> intimidating because like, I, like I, as I've said, like I came in not ever having done any feature animation before. And here are the gods of feature animation. You know, like you walk into the mail building, at, uh, main building, and there's like a whole case of the Oscars that these people have I mean, won. Just the, the director of, of Mon Monsters, Inc. is literally there. <laughs> yeah, so that was a, that was really like, uh, thank God Pete Doctor is such a kind and grounded person because it was really like, I had to not fangirl when I saw him, you know? Um, <laughs> and Up, all those movies. Oh, like, no, no. Incredible, no. right? So, so the Brain Trust is amazing because um, they come in and they, they read the script. Like, so one of the first things we had to get Greenlit into production was they had to, as a group, approve the, the script. But then just with every reels, like there's a long session. There's like a whole thing where it's like a ritual now, right? It's like you present the movie, everyone watches the screening. Uh, and then there's like a two to three hour note session, you know, of just going around the room and everybody chiming in. Um, and the brain trust 
at one time can be as small as, you know, 10 people or as big as 20 or more. So oh, wow. um, it's really intimidating, but it's also really, really helpful. And um, a big part of our brain trust was also, um, I mean, Pete Doctor was one of the exact producers, but Dan Scanlon, who had just, you know, was doing Onward and then came off it. Um, and Adrian Molina uh, was, I think, the AP on it. Um, so they all would kind of help not so there was a brain trust, but then the three of them also felt like they really kind of helped shape the conversation and pull out what they thought were the most pertinent things. Um, and they gave us deep notes. They were not easy notes. They weren't just like, why don't you just change the scene or maybe this mm -hmm. line would work. They were like deeply structural notes. And um, I think what makes it effective though is I get, I mean, I get notes all the time and being in TV, you get notes from executives, you get sure. notes from all sorts of people, you know, but what makes it nice at Pixar is you're getting the notes from other people who have wrestled with these same problems, who have suffered <laughs> through these same things. Sure. And that sense of like mutual understanding that they were coming at you from a place of people who had been there before, I think was enormously reassuring and made it uh a much more nurturing process than a destructive process. That, yeah, because I've always wondered what it was like to be in that room uh, and, and, and go through that again and again. It's not one time, too. It's you do it multiple yeah, over times and over. over and over again. And yeah. it's that's that's that kind of deconstruction of the stories. I was telling you one of my one of my dear friends used to work at Disney Animation and they would just like completely throw away their entire movie. And they go, okay, we got nine months to do the entire thing from scratch. And I asked you, is it is it like that at Pixar? And you're like, absolutely. <laughs> it's insanity. Like, I have no idea how they do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because, they'll because they'll throw away, like, months of work. Like, it's yeah. not just like the writing has been thrown away. Sets, that digital sets have been built. Characters have been built. I mean, yes. there's been work, millions of dollars of development and A&R and, and, yeah. and uh, yeah. everything. And it's gone if it doesn't work gone this is brutal yeah. yeah and you know and i think the ideal is to do as little of that as possible obviously <laughs> obviously it's not the goal to throw things away but but i do feel like there is a kind of um commitment that is really nice which is they will they will fight for a movie that works and is up to what they believe in you know they will not let it go just you know what? Forget it. It's good enough. I never heard that. I never heard it. <laughs> I, 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 I doubt that you would ever will uh, at Pixar. <laughs> um, now, when is uh, when is it coming out and where can people see it? So the movie is coming out tomorrow on Disney Plus. Okay. Which is exciting. And I think actually today it's rolling out globally, I want to say. So I think other countries are seeing it in their theaters. And there are some theaters that are showing it for a limited uh, release. Right. So I would say if anyone out there thinks this movie uh, is up their alley, uh, whether it's because you're Canadian or love boy bands or whatever. Um, <laughs> Which was great, by possible, the way. <laughs> yeah, right? like just cat, the widest net possible. But I would say like if you can safely watch it in a theater, it's really an amazing, fun experience to watch it with a large group of people. So um, whether it's streaming or in person, um, the movie uh, will be out tomorrow so and, and there, there was and there was uh, that's one of my favorite parts of the movie is the boy band scenario it was just <laughs> such a like as i'm listening to it, i'm like oh my god these are all my girlfriends like that's how they you could tell that that that, that came from us that had to have come from personal experience of like you know who yes. be, be, the, between the director and you like it was so perfectly on point of the love that a young girl has for a ridiculous boy band <laughs> they yes. just lose yeah. their mind over it it's, it's it was yeah. so perfectly done <laughs> yeah no i think that was really a fun discovery to make like that her only goal in life <laughs> is to go to a concert for yeah, was it oh was, was it called o-town well there is an actual band called o-town but the band for the movie's purposes is called four town four so town that's four right town. And, but there was five of them brilliant <laughs> That's right. That's just absolutely brilliant. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions to ask all of my guests. Yeah. Um, what, adv uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Just love it. Love what you're doing. Love writing. Love writing so much that nothing can make you stop writing. And, um, and pray. <laughs> Do what I did. Get on your knees. <laughs> get on your knees and pray. <laughs> Lord, please help me get through this scene. 
<laughs> now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? There's so many things I'm still trying to learn. And I think the thing I've only started to learn now is how to integrate all the different parts of my writing selves, mm -hmm. because I did have a playwright self and a TV mm -hmm. self and then a Pixar self. And I would keep them compartmentalized because I thought it would be, I, I don't know what I thought. I guess I thought I couldn't be all those things at once. And I think now is me trying to be Blend one up. coherent writer who does all of that and does it all you know uses all of herself with each project she writes no matter what the genre so the dark movies the dark plays are in a room with 10 people couldn't be over at pixar <laughs> yeah that's all actually i used to think they were all so separate but, but those boundaries were imaginary they were illusions you know that i put there and uh, is there are there three pilots or three screenplays that all screenwriters should read? Three pilots of screenplays that all scriptwriters should read. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, three pilots. This is such a great question. That I want to give it a great answer. Oh my god. Um, okay. I, I don't know how to answer this question. Whatever comes to the top of your head. Uh, can I also throw in some plays? Sure, because, like, absolutely. I feel like of they're course. kind of urtex for... Um, sure, sure, sure. So I know it's like really esoteric and I brought it up in uh, something I was writing the other day, but there's this like really great play. <laughs> this is so esoteric. It's it's a, it's a Antigone. It's an, a modern adaptation of Antigone, which is like this really old play, right? Sure, but sure. it's one of my touchstones of like a young woman's independence and voice um and it's translated from the french again this sounds so pretentious and i don't mean it to but it's just <laughs> such a good play and it's called antigone by um jean ennui it's just spelled a-n-o-u-i-l-h or something but just okay. google antigone um but then i would say that in terms of scripts i think i think there really is something to learn from from reading Aaron Sorkin scripts, I'll just say, Ugh. just because I think because he's such a master of dialogue and I think he shows a way to kind of break the rules in a way that everybody, it's like he almost reinvents the rules, you know, and I think there's a lot to be inspired by with that. Um, so I think reading his dialogue is sometimes like a master class and how to have a two-hander. Um, but then in terms of a pilot, uh, gosh, I will confess, I don't actually read pilots too much because mm -hmm. I myself, um, I don't know what it is, but I think like I don't want other voices to get in my own way. Sure. Um, but if you are going to read something, I, I guess I just, because I recently looked at it and, and it's not TV exactly, but I still find the the voice of um, something like Juno really inspiring because it yeah. is like so specific. Um, so I would say that. And, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to keep thinking about this question because it's such a great question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like, now I have to, like, I have to really think about that. Like, what should you read? Oh, I, and I would say this. I would read uh, Moonlight by Barry Jenkins. Oh, like this, such a great. The beauty of, of something, you know. That's beautiful. And, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of, lot and of I, great. And then what's amazing is all those scripts are, are actually available. So yeah. how wonderful is that? Yeah, absolutely. They're available online. A lot of them are available on our site, so you could definitely check them out. Uh, Julia, it's been an absolute ple pleasure talking to you. It's been so much fun going down uh, down the path with you on your journey and uh, getting an inside look at you know one of the greatest storytelling machines in modern history and uh, and seeing your perspective of the whole thing. So continued success, and I hope everybody goes out and sees Turning Red, which is, uh, and, and maybe he watches a boy band here or there, who knows. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you so much. Thank you for, uh, for doing what you do. Oh, thank you for doing what you do. Are you kidding? Yeah, totally. Thank you.